Thank you, Corey. Thank you for having me. I actually have been at this conference when Mark Green was doing it. And Mark Green was also, for the folks who didn't know him, was uh, at the Medical University of South Carolina and uh, had the privilege of working with him. And uh, I often tell people uh, this this conference couldn't have gotten two people between Mark and Corey who know the literature better in lung cancer, actually better than a lot of pulmonologists uh, uh, who, who, who do this every day, like myself. So this was actually a tough lecture to put together because uh, I don't know if people know, the new staging classification is sort of getting put together by the International Association for the Study of Lung Cancer. And, and we've been struggling with this a lot. I, I, just just uh, as an aside, I see between five and seven new lung cancers a week in, in a, a multidisciplinary lung cancer setting. So uh, I'm not just um, um, flying around to talk about this stuff. I, I see these folks every week and, and try to uh, diagnose and stage them and then get them off to the most appropriate therapy. Um, all the disclosures I have are really related to research funding. I don't do any uh, other types of uh, paid by company presentations. Um, why is it really important to stage? And I often put this slide up because I, I think people lose sight of the fact that it used to be sort of surgery and then everything else. And now for each stage, we have uh, different treatment options for stage one, surgery, uh, and if they're inoperable, stereotactic body radiotherapy. For stage two, surgery with adjuvant chemotherapy. Stage three, radiation with chemotherapy. And stage four, chemotherapy and the target and or the targeted agents or supportive care if they have a poor performance status. So if we get this wrong on the front end, I think people suffer from not getting the most appropriate therapy for their disease. And I think really it's the important role of both the pulmonologists and surgeon and interventional radiologists to get that answer correct so that oncologists can treat uh, appropriately. I also uh, sort of talk to people about this spectrum, which is we also have the job of uh, performing a physiologic stage as well as an anatomic stage. And so you can see that if you move uh, down towards a poor physiologic stage, you can go from resectable to unresectable. You can go from surgical to stereotactic uh, body radiotherapy or a, a lesser surgery, a wedge or a, a segmentectomy. And then if, if you go to uh, uh, the advancing stages, you move from uh, definitive to palliative in this regard. So I think one of the, the jobs for us is to make sure that we get our patients prepared uh, for, uh, for, uh, for treatment by showing, uh, by, uh, showing you that they're both fit for uh, their treatment as well as in the appropriate stage for their treatment. So, you know, this talk a few years ago was why, why a new staging and now a new, new, new staging system. The seventh uh, uh, staging system is now nearly nine years old, um, and one of the things is that we're, pers we're prospectively uh, uh, gaining data. The sixth edition uh, was published in 2002 and really made no changes to the previous edition with regards to lung cancer. By the way, the fifth edition in 1997 was 5,300 cases, almost entirely surgical and, and really largely from one institution. Um, and since 75, there have been many refinements uh, uh, in, this, uh, in the staging system, principally the routine use of computed tomography and now PET scanning. So add all that together, and the biggest changes, I think, came in this uh, uh, sixth edition uh, here. And so uh, let me move along. So this is the IASLC, oops, excuse me, uh, uh, IASLC Cancer Staging Project. Uh, the sixth edition was again in 2002, and the seventh edition, uh, Goldstraud L, published in the Thur Journal of Thoracic Oncology in 2006. And you can see that they, what they had done was really separate the groups using much larger groups of data and included a lot of non-surgical patients so you could get discrimination in that stage three, four area in the seventh edition. And you can see how widely different uh, the survivorships are. And you know, again, I, one of the things I always am uh, uh, stunned by is the fact that we look at stage 1A and think, oh, well, we must, we must be really doing pretty well if they have these tiny coin lesions. But even those patients have a five-year survivorship that's only 75, 75 or so percent. And it drops significantly when you get down to one, stage 1B, which is a surgical disease, at 58 percent, and then it drops off uh, dramatically as we, uh, uh, as we increase the stage. 
So the seventh edition had 81,000 patients, way up from that 5,000 patients, and they were collected from 1990 to 2000. And now we have a proposed eight, eighth edition, and this has not gone through the AJCC for approval, but you're going to see the publications coming out on the new recommendations for the T status, the N status, and the M. The T was already published, uh, Rami Porter et al. Uh, in Journal of Thoracic Oncology this year. The N and M are in press and coming out. And the proposed eighth edition is a bit more accurate, includes PET data, and includes a prospective uh, data collection instrument, which is, I think, very nice. There are some problems, and I want to point them out, and I'd love to hear Harvey Pass, who's going to be the next speaker, comment on some of these issues I think uh, are related to this new system. So what changed in 2009? What are you working with right now? What changed was we, 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 put, we had a T1A and 1B in the seventh edition as opposed to T1 uh, and T2, and we split these into what I would just like people to sort of remember as 2, 3, 5, and 7. The big change was that uh, the greater than 7 centimeter people became uh, T3 in the new staging system. Why did that help? That helped because we give uh, adjuvant chemotherapy to T3. If they were T3, the, we've learned that these large tumors probably do poorly, and so we were able now to give, uh, you know, uh, chemotherapy as adjuvant for these T3 very large tumors. The other thing we did was we put nodules in the same lobe. We downgraded those from T4 to T3, which took them from stage 3B to, in fact, sometimes stage uh, uh, two, and they could be operated on. Now, people were operating any anyway on two nodules in the same lobe, but it sort of gave credence to that. The other thing we did which in, the, in the last iteration, which I thought was incredibly important, was we moved pleural fusion, which I don't know why people had it here in the first place, which was T4, uh, and by definition, stage 3B, into what it really belonged in, which was metastatic disease. Why is that important? Do you know that what we called wet 3B in the past for the people around this room that are senior, um, those folks were left out of clinical trials, and that was a, sort of a shame. So we really didn't know a lot about what was going on with these malignant pleural fusions, and they became M1A. The other distinction we made was M1B, which was distant uh, metastatic disease outside the chest. This, this distinction I wasn't so happy about because it really didn't change therapy at all. Those uh, folks with M1A and M1B were both treated as uh, metastatic disease. So these were the big T changes that occurred uh, in there. Now, what are the new recommendations? Man, if you guys think it was difficult to stage uh, patients before, we're now uh, getting really, really sensitive. And what I would ask people in the room to think about is, is this really going to change my practice? I think on the last slide, I showed you a few areas where it would change. You would give adjuvant therapy for a patient with a large tumor. You would reclassify a patient with malignant pleural fusion as metastatic disease, and now include them in the metastatic trials. I'm not so sure about this. So T1A and T1B, so now we're splitting it into one centimeter increments, T1A one centimeter, T1B one to two, one C two to three, 2A is 3 to 4, 2B 4 to 5, T3 is between 5 and 7, and T4 is greater than 7. I, I'll talk about what I think those could be for implications, but, but largely, I mean, I carry the card around even still, and I work with this stuff all the time. I don't know, we, we're going to need an app for this or something, because this is going to get a little crazy outside of research circles. One important distinction, I, I think, from surgeons' viewpoint and mine all along, has been that they rightfully moved a main bronchus T2 regardless from the distance from the crina. So it used to be if you were within two centimeters of the crina, it was T3. Why was that the wrong thing to think about? Well, often as a pulmonologist, we see tumors growing out of the right main stem orifice and just like the stalk of a cauliflower coming up into the, uh, towards the carina, but it really was meaningless and surgeons could get around that and resect and do a, a lobectomy just fine. Partial and total atelectasis and pneumonitis is now T2. It was T3. I think that's an important one. And we reclassified diaphragm invasion as T4. That was T3. And, and I think we recognize that some things are better, like this thing growing towards the crina, and some things were worse. Diaphragmatic invasion now is T4. And we deleted mediastinal pleural invasion as a T descriptor at all, and I think that was probably a good thing to do. 
So, but the, the real crux is these, T, these, these centimeter increments, uh, and I'll talk about those in a second. So in the seventh edition, these are the T values that we had, and now the proposed eighth edition, again, you get a lot of discrimination. That's why I like it so much. The question, though, is, is it going to change how we manage patients? And I think that's an important aspect which, for which I don't really have an answer for you. Um, what I would say, again, is if you look at this new T4 with diaphragmatic evasion, you do have a poor prognosis around 40% and T3 around 57%. But look at the T1As, these are the one centimeter tumors, 92% survivorship. One of the reasons I think they set this up is for this whole idea around what are we gonna do with screening populations? Um, and so that's a kind of interesting uh, question. Uh, so interestingly, when they did multivariate analysis, uh, age was a factor, so the hazard ratio, you're twice as likely to die if you were uh, greater than 60 and less. But this was really interesting. Americans uh, and, and also Europeans, by the way, did worse than a, their Asian counterparts. This is incredibly important, and it's a criticism I have of uh, uh, the generalizability of the data. The Japanese dominated the amount of cases they put into this database. So we have 16,000 cases from Asia versus 32 from the US and Europe combined. Why is that important? That's important because I believe, and I think most uh, thoracic sort of oncologists believe that uh, adenocarcinoma in, in Asia is a different disease biologically. And so if, if that's the case, the outcomes are likely to be better and maybe everything I showed you on the last slide about this distinction between one and two and three and four and five is really different. If you look at other histologies versus adeno, they do worse, uh, sort of, you know, increasing the uh, you know, uh, what I think about this in general, increasing T size, not surprisingly, as you go up between T sizes, small and big, you get a worse outcome. So I keep my eye on this, uh, this group. One of the things, I, I'm, I'm very interested in this whole uh, age and lung cancer thing, as the average age of onset of lung cancer is 70, we're operating on 75 and 80 and 85 year olds now uh, increasingly, and so this age issue in lung cancer is gonna become an increasingly important topic. Um, okay, so what happened in the N status? I've actually put this into one slide, and you're seeing this. This is in press and not out, so you're seeing this before lots of other folks. Um, they, they actually remain completely unchanged, thank God, because almost all clinical trials are based on the N. However, they're really starting to distinguish, and I think this is good prognostically, and it may be good for designing trials, into single-station lymphadenopathy and multiple-station lymphadenopathy, and this is even in the N1 area, which is the hilum. And so I think it, it, it's something I think surgeons have recognized for a long time, and I, th I think as a pulmonologist doing a lot of EBIS, I've recognized, which is we see um, bulky Hyler disease, and we go, well, why is that so much different than mediastinal disease? And in fact, what you're going to see in the next slide or two is that it's not. Um, uh, bulky N1 disease is just as bad as N2 disease, which is ipsilateral mediastinal adenopathy. The survival curves for N1 bulky and N2A2, that's a single lymph node station that doesn't have hyler adenopathy, so-called skip lesions, are exactly the same. N2A1, which is a single lymph node station, has a better prognosis than N1B, though it wasn't significant. So the conclusion from the N recommendations, and remember, maybe I should have said this first, N0 is no lymphadenopathy, N1 is largely hyler adenopathy, that's a surgical disease, N2 is that sort of big dividing line, ipsilateral N2 disease or stage 3A disease, largely chemoradiotherapy, or if you believe in neoadjuvant chemo, chemotherapy followed by surgery. And then N3 disease is across the mediastinum, uh, uh, opposite side of the mediastinum, which is clearly uh, not a, a surgical disease. So the rec what they recommend is that they don't change the, the, the descriptors for the eighth edition, but physicians should be recording the number of nodes and further classifying it into these new descriptors su such as N1A, single station N1 disease, N1B, bulky station, N2A, single station, N2B, uh, bulky station, and N3 for further testing in the future. So thankfully N hasn't changed, but people are going to be asking uh, in our cancer registries to record these facts and uh, figures, and that's in press for Journal of Thoracic Oncology. 
So the M edition, uh, Ralph Eberhardt is going to be publishing also in Journal of Thoracic and Oncology and Press. And M1A is going to stay the same, metastatic disease within the thorax. M1B is currently at distant metastatic sites, but there is a recommended change, which I think is quite an interesting one from a research perspective. And, and one of the things I've been seeing more and more and more at our tumor board is at a clinical perspective, which is, which is what do we do about single metastatic foci outside the chest, so the single brain met? where we are treating these patients and we've treated them and they've had a single brain met resected or had, um, or, or a single brain met not resected or a single uh, adrenal metastasis. And should we be going back if we have clearance of disease everywhere else and doing a metastatectomy? And that's a very, very tricky business. And, and these patients, there may be a lot different about these patients biologically. And nonetheless, I think identifying them for clinical trials um, and, and then perhaps talking about clinical regimens for these patients with a single metastatic focus is an important thing. So I'm, I'm okay with this. I'm not okay with um, just saying if you have single metastatic focus, you should go on and have that resected, but I'm okay with us keeping this data. So, um, you know, the implication for these staging recommendations are, it's more work, man. It's incredible. Like, I have a hard enough time keeping up with the work I have. And I, I ask the question, is there an app for that? And I really think we need an app for this so we can just go in and click in and go, okay, this is what it is, and, and, and have the, the fellows in the clinic take care of that for me. Um, we have to understand which recommendations will lead to changes in clinical practice. So one example might be for T1A, that's a centimeter or less, they might be managed either with lesser surgery, so-called a segmentectomy, or even non-surgical techniques. So if we have an, a very elderly patient with a less than one centimeter screen-detected tumor that we know is an adenocarcinoma, might we think about not resecting that patient and doing stereotactic body radiotherapy? Um, the end status will perhaps be thinking about treating single-site N2 disease like N1 disease with surgery followed by adjuvant therapy. I love that approach. I actually believe more in that approach than neoadjuvant. Um, and then would we treat bulky N1 disease like N2 disease? That's a question I, I have in mind for here. And would we do metastatectomy for single site metastatic disease? And then I do think enrollment in clinical trials is going to be affected by this. And I think perhaps in a positive way um, if, we, if, we, if we really start to enroll more uh, folks. Um, so, you know, then the question came up, I was asked to ask about, what, you know, what about histologic and then molecular staging? And then, so, so non-small cell, uh, Bill Travis said in, in 11, look, it can't, it can't, it's unacceptable as pathologic diagnosis uh, or descriptor as an operational category for clinical management. And we know that, and this will be shown probably throughout this, that, you know, uh, EGFR, TKIs work, and, uh, and, 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 and they might be expensive, but they work. Um, and we can see here, that in, in the totality of the data, much better outcome if you know that you have an EGFR, TKI uh, lesion. So on the basis of the results of five phase three clinical trials, patients with advanced non-small cells should have their tumor tested for EGFR mutations to determine whether this exists or not. Sadly, you can't, we're, we're not doing a great job of testing, and I think you need to hold your pulmonologist, and I am one of those guys, accountable. They need to deliver, you need to sit with your pulmonologist and your pathologist and have your pathologist and pulmonologist have a cup of coffee, fight out how they want their specimen sent and, and talk about sending it, but we need to be testing our advanced cancer patients for this. Um, and uh, same with, it, this is a, a slide showing EML for alkin outcomes. And this is that, you know, we, we talk, uh, our last speaker talked about that one case where you gave him the pill and the miraculous recovery occurred. And this is my slide of that miraculous recovery for crizotinib and an EML4 ALK mutation. Um, and ROS1, same sort of crazy good outcome, which we see, but not so, so often. Um, but, but, uh, but I want to talk about this study, which may come up again, uh, Mark Chris's study in JAMA, where we talked about the Lung Cancer Mutation Consortium. And we were part of this trial where uh, 1,000 patients around the United States in 14 centers delivered a uh, good, good amount of tissue. And a lot of it was cytology-based tissue from EBUS uh, and, and, and also uh, uh, done with uh, 
target uh, with um, core biopsies uh, sent from 19, uh, 2009 to 12, and the goal was to look at 10 genes. Those were the 10 genes at the time, and, and, and I don't think it matters for the purposes of this audience, the 10 genes at the time that they were looking at. This is really the crux of that study that I, I, I'm trying to get across to folks, which is if you had a target, so they, in 1,000 patients, they tested for at least one gene. 733 were tested for all 10. That, to me, is a failure on my part, which means I didn't give people enough tissue or enough of the right tissue to test 250 patients. And I'm, my lab is working diligently on making sure we provide enough tissue, and I want pathologists to work diligently on doing more with less, by the way. And there are driver mutations found in 64% of that 733, and results were used to select therapy in 28%. So, so what I would tell you is this, this is incredibly important. If you had a targeted, uh, a, uh, if you had a target and you used the targeted therapy, you had a really good outcome, 3.5 uh, year median survival. If you had uh, a, 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 a target but didn't use a targeted therapy, you still had a little bit better outcome, suggesting the biology of people with targets is different. But if you didn't have a target and you had no driver mutation, you did uh, about as well as, uh, as could be expected for somebody with lung cancer. So you got to test, I think. Um, and this was shown in the previous slide, so I won't go over it. I think this is going to change markedly over the next few years. Um, and this is uh, from uh, 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 JTO in 2012, just looking at the different targets that we have. And this is an interesting slide uh, uh, that was given to me by someone else, but in 2008, uh, we virtually had no targets to look at. We had a few of these things here. 2015, they're going up, but it's expected that these number of targets could go up to 200 in the next five years, and how are we going to test and how much tissue we are going to need is, a, is a quite an interesting dilemma, and you can see how we think this is going to grow over time. And so how about tissue analysis in 2015? We have a tumor. We say whether it's small cell or non-small cell. We do IHC staining. We say whether it's adenocarcinoma or it's squamous. We shouldn't use a lot of tissue to do that, by the way. We do mutational analysis, and we have an actionable target. So this, I would, oh, oh I want to go back. This, I would say, is the real issue. You know, mediastinoscopy had lost a lot of steam uh, over time, and I don't blame people now for saying, I wonder whether we shouldn't do more mediastinoscopy if we need tissue for these uh, 200 targets. I, I would argue that we can still do it with EBUS, but we gotta get better at it, and we have to do more with less. This is taken from our meta-analysis uh, as part of the American College of Chest Physician guidelines, and over a 10-year period, um, we saw the number of EBUS studies rise. So uh, if you look at the 10,000 mediastinoscopy, the sensitivity, 81%, any of the needle techniques uh, uh, performed pretty well. Got to understand whether you're at comparing apples to apples. You know, a lot of times we're looking at bulky mediastinal disease and, and the sensitivity should be high and a lot of times Harvey Pass is looking at a completely negative mediastinum on radiograph and going in and doing a med. Be that as it may, um, in that addition to the guidelines and Frank Dederbeck, a surgeon from Yale, um, we said that EBIS, uh, any of the needle techniques, is recommended as the best first test. It's less invasive um, and, and can give you a good sensitivity. So how good is it, though, for mutational analysis? I'm going to show you three papers. This is Tommy Nakajima from, uh, uh, from uh, the group in Toronto looking at 156 patients in multi-gene mutation analysis. They did a cell block. EGFR uh, and now PCR analysis was positive in, um, uh, was impossible in 98% of patients and KRAS and P53 in 74% of patients. So really good in that study. They were some of the best uh, people uh, uh, in the world at doing this. This is molecular testing uh, in Journal of Cytopathology in 2011. They looked at DNA sequencing for EGFR and KRAS, 96% of EBIS samples were adequate. 
Um, this study by Neil Navani I thought was really good, and, and the reason I did this was in our blue journal, which is our sort of top-level journal, 774 patients. This was done in five centers in the UK, and three of them were community-based centers, and so this starts to get more, in my view, towards reality rather than just coming out of the best centers in the world. Um, and these were less experienced centers, and 90% of the time EGFR mutation analysis was possible. Um, and then this, I, I think, is an interesting study published in PLUS One in 2013. They looked at 106 specimens prospectively, forceps biopsy, EBUS, and CT guided core biopsy, and the samples were split into two, uh, FFPA and DNA and RNA later, molecular markers were done for EGFR mutation, ERCC1, RRM1, it doesn't matter, and BRCA1. All three methods, not surprisingly, provided sufficient tumor material for multiple biomarker testing. And EBUS provided the highest amount of tumor RNA compared to bronchoscopy or CT-guided core biopsy. So in conclusions, I'm actually, was I given really 40 minutes to talk about this? Because I... I, I, because it's got 14 minutes left, but we could talk about a lot of other stuff if we want. Um, staging is critical, and if I, listen, I, if I don't emphasize anything today is, I, I don't really care how you get the tissue, and I really don't have a, a dog in that fight. What I do think is that uh, the most common second opinion of mismanaged cases I get in my clinic are people who've been misstaged or understaged um, and treated based on that staging. For example, false positive PET in the mediastinum where they haven't had their mediastinum evaluated. And then they get chemo RT only to find out they never had mediastinal disease at all and they weren't adequately staged. So it's critical because the treatment choices are so different by stage. I think the new recommendations further refine that staging system um, and I think there's been a, a paradigm shift towards uh, targeted therapy in non-small cell lung cancer. It's advanced stage lung cancer has to be tested for driver mutations. The difference between an oral medication and a three and a half year median survival is incredible and we, we can't not give patients that opportunity. I think EBUS is reliable modality, but if you don't have that available to you and, and you have a surgeon who does metastinoscopy or if your EBUS is not reliably uh, undertaken, um, then I don't care. Have an interventional radiologist do it, but you have to provide adequate tissue. And that's a communication issue. And honestly, uh, the one common question I get from oncologists and others is, you know, listen, my pathologist just won't call it. And, and I think that deserves a meeting with your pathologist, your, your surgeon, your pulmonologist, um, and your oncologist. And, and I would say that in going through this lecture, and, and I did actually put this together for this talk, uh, someday we could see the following, a T1B, N2A, M1B, adenocarcinoma, EGFR uh, negative, ROS1 positive. And we do already see some of that in breast literature, right? We see patients with stage one breast cancer, HER2, new positive, ERPR, uh, uh, negative, for example. And so this patient, by the way, uh, I don't know if I have it on the next slide. So what is this? <laughs> what is that? That's a stage four lung cancer, a tumor between one and two centimeters with ipsilateral hyaluradenopathy and a single met outside the chest. They're eligible for carizotinib therapy and perhaps, perhaps aggressive treatment of that single met. How about that? It made me a little dizzy, um, but that's what we have. So, um, uh, Corey, as always, thank you so much. I'm a native New Yorker as well, and my daughter's now going to college here, so I'm, I'm happy to be back in New York, get to see my daughter. I'm very blessed to uh, be able to work with people like Corey and Harvey Past and others, and thank you for your kind attention.